Good afternoon. Welcome to our Calvary Chapel Northwest Sunday service. Good to see your faces. Welcome to you as well online. Uh, today we have the privilege of embarking upon a new book of the Bible, having finished our study last week in the book of Ephesians. For those of you who are unaware, here at Calvary Chapel, we teach through the books of the Bible, chapter and verse, from the beginning of a book through to its end. It makes it easy for you to know what's coming. Wherever I stop in our Bible study, we are just going to pick it right up from that place the following week. And also, you can read ahead. I encourage that. As uh, we go through the book of First Peter, uh, it'd be helpful if you just read ahead and read through that book several times and allow the Holy Spirit to just speak to your heart as the messages come. Uh, having said that, our text for this morning is First Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. If you will turn there in your Bibles, you can follow along with me as I read. 1 Peter 1, starting in verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace be multiplied. Let's pray. Our gracious God, we come before you this morning, Lord. We thank you for another opportunity to gather as a family, to gather as your body, the body of Jesus Christ, to open your word, Lord, and behold wondrous things. Lord, I ask God that you would speak through me, Lord, as I Surrender myself to you, Lord. Use me to communicate your word. And God, I pray for the hearers, Lord, that their hearts be receptive, good soil, ready to receive your word, Lord God, and for that word to bear fruit in each and every life, drawing each person to a closer and more intimate relationship with you. And Lord, if there's any here that does not know you as their Savior, or any listening online, I pray, dear God, that today would be the day that they come into that personal relationship with you and their lives are changed forever. We ask you these things, Lord God, in your precious and holy name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. First, by way of introduction, let's identify the author of the book, the time of the writing, the place it came from. The author of this book identifies himself as Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. So we know who wrote it. Where was it written from? Well, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13 gives us an indication of where Peter wrote this epistle from. It says, she who is in Babylon elect together with you greets you. And so does Mark, my son. Peter is referring to the local church in feminine form, as often is done. He's calling the church she, and he says that she is in Babylon. This is more likely a, a metaphor, using the word Babylon for Rome, which had taken the place filled in the Old Testament by ancient Babylon as the seat of power in opposition to the people of God. Now that seat of power in Peter's day at the time of this writing is Rome. Peter wrote this letter around 64 AD just as a great persecution from the Roman Emperor Nero was ramping up. So at the onset of our study here, let's take a few moments and get to know this man whom the Holy Spirit used to pen this epistle. Before Peter became the Apostle Peter, filling a position of great authority in the church, he was Peter the disciple, a disciple of Jesus Christ. A disciple is a learner, 
one who comes alongside to be taught. An apostle is one that is sent forth. And we have the office of apostle, which Peter held. But he started out as a disciple. Now, if you just read about the calling to Peter's discipleship in Matthew 5, you would be left with the impression that Jesus, being a complete stranger to Peter, just walked up to him and said, follow me. And Peter responded by immediately leaving his business. He was a fisherman. He owned his own business, leaving his, his business, including his boat and his nets, and he followed Jesus. That would be remarkable. Let's look at that incident in Matthew 5, verse 18 through 19. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers. Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Does that leave you with the impression that Jesus just walked up and called these guys, and they left their business and followed him? If it went down exactly like that, that would truly be remarkable, wouldn't it? But it wasn't exactly like that. The Gospel of Mark gives us just a little bit more detail to this calling. Look at Mark chapter 1, verse 16 through 18. And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. At least here, we have some intent communicated to them, some purpose for the call. I will make you fishers of men. But still, to leave one's business with no prior of knowledge of Jesus would still be extraordinary. Fortunately, the Gospels of John and Luke fill in all the gaps that makes Peter's calling more rational. Let's look at John chapter 1, verses 35 through 42. It says, again, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples. And looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and seeing them following said to them, what do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which is to say when translated teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and see. They came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. Now it was about the 10th hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew. Simon Peter's brother, he first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus looked at him, he said, you are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. So here we see that Peter's brother, Andrew, was a disciple of John the Baptist. He was a follower of John the Baptist. And what was John's message? John's message to his disciples was repent because Jesus is coming. And then one day Jesus walks by and John says, there he is, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So John followed Jesus. Or Andrew followed Jesus, John having pointed his disciples to Jesus. Andrew hangs out with Jesus, and then he immediately goes to Peter and tells him, Hey, hey, Simon, we found him, the Messiah, Jesus. And he takes Simon to meet Jesus, and Jesus changes his name from Simon to Peter, meaning a stone a little rock. But neither one of them have been called as disciples yet, but they have met Jesus and they are following Jesus. 
Now let's take a look at Luke chapter 438. It says, Jesus left the synagogue and went to Simon's house. Simon's mother-in-law was very sick. She had a high fever. They asked Jesus to do something to help her. He stood very close to her and ordered the sickness to go away. The sickness left her, and she got up and began serving them. So Simon Peter has now been traveling with Jesus. Jesus goes to his house and heals his mother-in-law. And then the Gospel of Luke, after this incident, records many more miracles that Jesus does. And Simon Peter is there. Then we get to Luke chapter 5 which coincides with the passages that we read earlier about the calling of Peter, Matthew chapter 4 and Mark chapter 1. Only Luke gives us much more detail than those two Gospels. Look at Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. As Jesus stood beside Lake Galilee, a crowd of people pushed to get closer to him and to hear the teachings of God. Jesus saw two boats at the shore of the lake. The fishermen were washing their nets. Jesus got into the boat that belonged to Simon. He asked Simon to push off a little from the shore. Then he sat down in the boat and taught the people on the shore. When Jesus finished speaking, he said to Simon, take the boat into the deep water. If all of you will put your nets into the water, you will catch some fish. Simon answered, Master. I can see the look on his face. Simon's a professional fisherman. Jesus is a carpenter. He's like, Master, we worked hard all night trying to catch fish and caught nothing. But you say I should put the nets into the water, so I will. The fishermen put their nets into the water. Their nets were filled with so many fish that they began to break. They called to their friends in the other boat to come and help them. The friends came and both boats were filled so full of fish that they were almost sinking. The fishermen were all amazed at the many fish they caught. When Simon Peter saw this, he bowed down before Jesus and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were amazed too. James and John worked together with Simon. Jesus said, don't be afraid. From now on, your work will be to bring in people, not fish. The men brought their boats to the shore. They left everything and followed Jesus. Now we have more context. They had knew Jesus. They had walked with Jesus. They had saw the miracles of Jesus. And then, on that fateful day, Jesus called them and said, it's time to give up your business and be my disciple full time. You will be fishers of men. This is how Peter was called. Now, Peter as a disciple was outspoken, much more outspoken than the other disciples. And he quickly became recognized as an unofficial leader and spokesman. It was Peter who said one of the most profound and spirit-led statements of all the disciples. And it was also Peter who said the most stupid and Satan-inspired statement, all in the same passage. Look at Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 to 23. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. What a great statement. 
profoundly spiritual. And Jesus gives Peter the greatest of all compliments. Peter, man, the flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. You are in contact with the Father. The Father is speaking to you. He has revealed to this, you this, this great truth. What a great compliment. Verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside. Have you ever took somebody aside? Peter's taking Jesus aside. He took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, far be it from you, Lord. This shall not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of man. You see, we see Peter going from being totally spirit-led to being led by his flesh, where he's not comprehending that Jesus is telling him that I must die for the sins of man. I must die and rise from the grave. To prevent this is a work of Satan. You are in your flesh. You are not being led by the spirit, Peter. Peter is a man of wild fluctuations. Peter was the only disciple who had the faith to get out of a boat in a boisterous sea and walk on water with Jesus. But this same Peter was a disciple that denied Jesus three times. This is our Peter during his first three years of knowing Jesus, a man of extremes going from one end of the spectrum to the other. But then there was Pentecost. There Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. He received the power that Jesus had promised. And then Peter preached the gospel of Jesus boldly. And 3,000 souls were added to the church that day. Peter was imprisoned. He was beaten and warned not to preach in this name of Jesus anymore. And he left prison rejoicing that he was counted worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. Peter was delivered from a different prison by an angel miraculously. Peter was the one who introduced the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles at the house of Cornelius, the Roman centurion. Now, Peter is writing this letter 30 years after physically walking with Jesus. 30 years after he witnessed Jesus' ascension into heaven. 30 years of walking by faith. No longer knowing Jesus in the flesh, but in the spirit. 30 years of developing into a godly, Mature apostle of Jesus Christ, no longer with wild, fluctuating behavior, but steady, strong in the Lord. No longer filled with foolish pride, but clothed in humility. The epistle of 2 Peter follows this epistle not long thereafter. And then, shortly after 2 Peter, Peter will die a martyr's death at the hands of Nero. History tells us that Peter was crucified upside down at his request because he felt unworthy to be crucified in the same manner as his Lord. This is the man that God used to write this letter, a faithful man, a godly man, a man wise and mature, in his walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Our text says Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. 
These five cities were located north of the Taurus Mountains in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. And this letter was meant to have wide distribution, as it is applicable to all Christians. Peter addresses them as pilgrims of the dispersion. Now, this group was a diverse group consisting of Gentiles and Jews, but the majority were Gentiles, yet Peter uses a name that is reminiscent of the Jews after Judah was conquered by Babylon, the dispersion. The word translated pilgrim here is parapedamos. It's an adjective signifying sojourning in a strange place, away from one's own people. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20 says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. We are ambassadors for Christ. What is an ambassador? An ambassador is a representative of a country in a foreign land. We are representing our country, heaven, in a foreign land. This world is not our home. God created this world to be our home, but our father Adam, gave up the deed. This world at least temporarily belongs to Satan. We are here on a mission. We are ambassadors, and our mission is a mission of reconciliation to rescue as many as would be rescued. Verse 2 in our text says we are elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Election. A clear doctrine revealed throughout God's word. But there is some issues on how some believe. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 through 5 says, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ, to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. We were elected, chosen, even before God laid the foundation of the world. Romans 8, 28 through 30 says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined, to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. Acts 13, 48. Now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believe. These verses tell us that we were destined, predestined, selected, called, chosen by God. God chose you to be on his team. Before the foundation of the world, he chose you personally. So what is the issue with election? The problem is that some have taken election to an extreme. And they have set election of God in opposition to free will, which is also clearly taught in God's word. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him, whosoever should not perish but have everlasting life. John 4.14, But whosoever Drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. Acts 2.21, and it shall come to pass that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Acts 10.43, to him all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. 
Romans 5, 18, therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to who? All men, resulting in justification of life. Romans 10, 13, for whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Titus 2.11, for the grace of God that brings salvation had appeared to all men. 1 John 5.1, whosoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. And finally, Revelation 22.17, and the spirit and the bride say come. And let him who hears say come. And let him who thirsts come. Whosoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. These verses make it clear that God provided salvation for who? Everyone. Whosoever wills. God's provision is not only for whosoever will. God's desire is that all men would be saved. Look at 2 Peter 3, 9. It says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 1 Timothy 2, 3 through 4. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Unfortunately, there are those that live at the extremes of both the doctrine of election and free will. At one extreme, we have Calvinism. Calvinists believe that man has absolutely no say in his salvation that his ability to choose is controlled by God completely, and God forces him to believe by what they call irresistible grace. The flip side to this doctrine, the ugly side of this doctrine, is, of course, that those who have not been chosen by God are going to hell, and they had no choice, absolutely no choice. God simply didn't choose them. Therefore, it would be impossible for them to come to him for salvation. This is in contradiction to whosoever will. It is God's desire for all to be saved. The other extreme is the Arminian view, which subordinates God's will to man's will. I reject both extremes based on God's word. Verse 2 of our text provides the key. God's election is based on his foreknowledge. It says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. This is also confirmed in Romans 8.29. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. So here is the bottom line. God has elected. Everyone that is to be saved prior to time and creation. God has offered the possibility of salvation to everyone. Christ paid for the sins of everyone on the cross. Man was created in the image of God with a mind, soul, and spirit, and with the ability to choose free will. And God has stipulated to man that he must exercise his will and receive his son for salvation. God did not arbitrarily choose some people to go to heaven and others to go to hell. Neither did God look into the future from eternity past to see who would receive him as Lord and predestined them based on their choice. God lives outside of time and space. God knows all things all at once at the same time. There was never a time that God did not know 
who would come to salvation in Christ. So God's predestination and his foreknowledge all occur at the exact same moment. Neither are subordinate to one another. The best way and the most simple way I can describe this is a door with a big sign that says, whosoever will may come to Jesus and be saved. You walk through that door and you get inside and you see a big sign that says, you have been chosen by God. Both doctrines are absolutely true. We must not go to the extreme of either, but just allow God's word to speak. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience. Our election in Christ results in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience. The word sanctified means to be set apart for a specific use and purpose. You were chosen by God and set apart as his own for his particular purpose. You should feel special because you are special. God chose you for his purpose. Hebrews 10, 14 says, For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. We are to walk in that sanctification. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. We need to walk in holiness in order to be sanctified in God. A person who doesn't know sanctification, who doesn't know what being set apart for God's purposes and obedience to God is, cannot claim to be part of God's elect. Let's go on. In sanctification of the spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, we see three instances where blood was sprinkled on people. The first was at the establishment of the Sinai Covenant. In Exodus chapter 24, verses 5 through 8. Then he sent young men of the children of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half the blood and put it in basins, and half the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, This is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. The sprinkling of the blood, testifying of the covenant. At the ordination of Aaron and his sons, there was sprinkling of blood. Exodus 29, 21. And you shall take some of the blood that is on the altar and some of the anointing oil and sprinkle it on Aaron and on his garments, on his sons and on the garments of his sons. With him and he and his garments shall be hollowed and his sons and his sons' garments with him. And then the third time their sprinkling of blood is at the purification ceremony for a cleansed leper. Leviticus 14, 6 and 7 says, As for the living bird, he shall take it, the cedar wood, the scarlet, the hyssop, dip them and the living bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over the running water. And he shall sprinkle it seven times on him who is to be cleansed from the leprosy and shall pronounce him clean and shall let the living bird loose in the open field. What beautiful imagery. Because all three instances of the sprinkling of blood apply to us. Jesus' blood is the blood of the new covenant. He said in Matthew 26, 28, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. That new covenant of, of mercy. 
that new covenant of grace that we live in by the blood of Jesus. As Aaron and his sons were priests, sprinkled with blood, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 tells us that we are a royal priesthood. We have been chosen as his priests to proclaim his praises. Finally, the declaring of the leper clean. The ceremony where a person cleansed of leprosy goes and is officially declared clean. Now they can go back into the family of God. They can go back into the congregation. They can be with other people. They have been officially declared clean. Leprosy represents our sin and the filth of our sin. It is the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all unrighteousness. We are clean through the blood of Jesus. Peter closes his greeting with, Grace to you and peace be multiplied. Grace and peace, in my humble opinion, are the absolute best things that Christians have in this life on earth, in our time. Grace is God's unmerited favor. We don't do anything to earn it. We cannot earn it. It is a free gift. God bestows it upon us lavishly and freely. Ephesians 2.8 says, By grace you have been saved through faith in that not of yourself. John 1.16 says, and of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. That means he just piles grace on top of grace. Romans tells us that we access grace by faith. Romans 5, 1 through 2 says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. God's unmerited favor, his grace, his riches that the believer has, which is beyond comprehension. Aren't you so thrilled that God continues to give you his grace every day? He lavishes upon you. And then in addition to grace, we have peace. Peace is my favorite. It doesn't matter what's going on externally if you have peace. It doesn't matter how the world is falling to pieces around you if you have peace. It doesn't matter what's going on in your own individual life if you have the peace of God. We're told in Isaiah 26, verse 3, that you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. What's trust? Faith. Again, it's linked with faith. Faith is our access into grace. Faith is how we have peace. We have peace because our mind is stayed on him and we trust him. If you don't trust him, it's because you haven't got to know him well enough. You need to dig in his word. You need to spend time in prayer. You need to spend time with other believers, fellowshipping, getting to know who Jesus is, and you will have the peace, the, the, the peace that Philippians 4, 6, and 7 speaks of. It says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication." With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Peter is writing this letter to those who are scattered and have to face persecution and suffering. When persecution and suffering comes, we need grace and we need peace. We are blessed. We live in the United States of America. We live in a land that was founded on 
freedom of religion, free speech. We can meet here without the fear of someone breaking through the door and carting us away for preaching the word of God. At least we could do it today. That may change. God hasn't promised us the, the, the luxury that we have lived in all of our lives. And as we go through this book of 1 Peter and we understand as we unite our hearts with our brethren of old who have already gone on to their reward and glory, and as we understand their suffering and how Peter encourages them in Christ, we need to prepare our hearts because we also may suffer. In our own ways, we do suffer. When you speak up for Jesus at work and people look at you like you have a horn growing out of your forehead, you're that weird one, you know, that, that talks about Jesus. You know, when your kids who are well-trained go to school and they're being indoctrinated in ungodliness and they stand up and say, that's not right. That's not right because the Bible, <laughs> the Bible, you believe in the Bible. Yeah, I believe in the Bible. I know Jesus personally. And you would do well if you believed in the Bible as well. You will endure persecution. But we have grace and we have peace. And that's all we need. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come into your hands, Lord God. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the example of our brother Peter whom we can relate to, Lord God, is sometimes, Lord, we live with wild fluctuations as well. We, we're in your will, and then we're stumbling and we fall. But, Lord God, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your unmerited favor and your love for us. Lord God, I want to extend that grace right now. If there's anyone here that does not know you as Savior, if it's there, anyone listening online that needs to receive you as their Savior, if you're listening to my voice in the privacy of bowed heads and closed eyes, I want to speak to you as the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and, and asking you to be his. Jesus is, is reaching out to you. He wants to love you. He wants to embrace you. He wants to forgive your sin. And all it requires is for you to surrender yourself to him, for you to make a choice to turn from doing your own thing and give that up to turn to Jesus. Is there anyone here that needs to receive Jesus as your Savior? If you do, just raise your hand, and I will pray with you to receive Jesus. Anyone here? If you're listening online, I obviously can't see your hand. But I want to pray a simple prayer with you. If you pray this from your heart and believe in faith, the Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord Jesus shall be saved. Gracious God, I believe that you died for my sin that you shed your blood, that you were buried, and that you rose again on the third day. I believe, Lord God, that your blood sacrifice was sufficient to pay for my sin, and I want you to take over my life and be my Lord. I want to surrender myself to you, Lord God. Come into my life and be my Lord. Save me in your holy name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Anyone praying that prayer from the heart, can have confidence that the Lord has come into your life and will direct you and guide you and grow you up as you continually surrender your heart to Jesus. For the saints of God, Lord, I just pray that we would draw closer to you, Lord, that we would surrender ourselves to you daily, that we would draw more intimate relationship with you, Lord God, that, God, you would just direct us, that you would heal us, Lord. I pray for all of those that need a healing touch. If that's you, I pray that God would touch your body and heal you right now. For those, Lord God, for Kelly and Lord, for David, Lord, those that are dealing with any types of malady or physical ailment, I pray that you would bring healing on them. Dear God, anyone dealing with maladies of the mind, depression, anxiety, I pray, Lord, that you would touch their minds, that you would give them that peace that passes understanding and bring healing, Lord God, as we set our hearts and minds on you. Gracious God, we love you. 
We surrender to your will, and we ask that you overflow us with your Holy Spirit in your precious name. Amen. God bless you. Please stand as we have one final worship song and dismiss you in the name of the Lord Jesus.